We now move on to questions to the Minister of Environment. And for uh, members' information, questions 1 and 12 have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. <coughs> I am extremely concerned by the number of road deaths this year. My sincere sympathy is with all of the families and communities affected by these tragedies. My department continues to take a range of actions to reduce deaths and serious injuries on our roads. We focus on the principal collision causation factors and on groups which are overrepresented in the casualty figures. These are a key focus of the road safety strategy to 2020. Over 100 of the 224 action measures in the strategy have been completed. They address issues including changes to road engineering, changes to the driving test and the setting up of a PSNI collision investigation unit. My department has also completed analysis of the reasons for the fall in road casualties in the period 2009 to 2012. That work concluded that the effects of the recession played some part, directly or indirectly, in the reductions in NI road fatalities in the period. However, based on the available evidence set out in the paper, the economic situation could not be said to be singly responsible. The effects of the recession appear to have included more fuel economic driving, which would have seen a reduction in speeding and an overall reduction in distances travelled. The recession may also have led to a reduction in drink driving. Economic factors could also account for the reduction in young male drivers. In this indirect way, the recession may have reduced road fatalities, despite counterfactors such as an increase in the age of the vehicle fleet. Previous recessions in Britain have also seen reductions in road fatalities. I have launched two new road safety campaigns this year, addressing cyclist safety and inappropriate speed. We are also developing a strategy to improve motorcyclist safety and take forward a fitness to drive review to consider factors which increase risks for older road users. I believe that these measures, along with others carried out by my department and our partners, will help save lives on our roads. Mr. Fergal McKinney for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his fulsome answer. Um, this, uh, my supplementary, touches on uh, uh, the recession, but in another way. And uh, what impl impl implications would cuts in departmental budgets have for measures to improve road safety? Um, I thank Mr. McKinney for the question and supplementary question. Since a budget for 2015-16 has not yet been agreed, I can't provide a full assessment of how resource pressures will impact on any area of my department or on my road safety partners. However, I do remain fully committed to working with stakeholders to improve road safety and to reduce casualties and particularly, and of course, fatalities. Reductions in funding will make a number of activities more challenging, including the creating and airing of road safety advertising by DOE, roads maintenance and improvement by DRD, and on-the-ground enforcement by the PSNI and DVA. The financial situation will require us to continue to work in a joined-up way across government and, indeed, across society to do things which make all of us as road users improve our behaviours. That is a challenge to which my officials and their colleagues in other government and community organisations are already rising with, for instance, extensive engagement on cycling, motorcycling and enforcement. Thank you. And I call Ms Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. One of the cuts recently made uh, on road safety is the road safety grants program for the voluntary and community sector even though letters of offer have been sent out to recipients um, and that grant now has been stopped um, so does the minister recognize that his own party's position on welfare reform is leading to cuts in vital services such as road safety I uh, thank uh, Ms Lowe for her question, but I think it's somewhat 
misdirected. I do recognise the, the, the value of the work carried out by the organisations through the grant to which she refers. However, I feel, failed to see any correlation between welfare reform and the current impasse around welfare reform and current budgetary decisions. It has been well publicised and may have been shared with Ms Lowe by her ministerial colleagues that the decision taken by the executive just uh, last week around the loan was kicking the welfare reform issue down the road. The cuts associated with that impasse on welfare reform have not been seen yet. In fact, the cuts that we are seeing now, and we all regret that we are seeing them, I am sure every minister regrets any cut that they have to make on their department. I particularly regret any cut that might have a detrimental impact on road safety and put people's lives at risk. But these are the outworkings of a flawed budget that was voted for in this Assembly almost three and a half years ago. It was a four-year budget. That was not fit for purpose. I do not think any it is ever possible to vote for a four-year budget, and that it will still be fit for purpose four, four years later, but it has nothing to do with welfare reform or my party's position on it. I'm going to call Ms Pam Cameron. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for his answers um, thus far. Uh, can the Minister tell us, in, in light of um, the very many fatalities we have had, especially this year, um, what, how effective does he uh, deem the, the very graphic and expensive television adverts, um, which are part of um, campaigns to cut road deaths? And obviously, uh, well, it's to be seen how effective that actually is. And does the minister um, appreciate that, that those campaigns can actually cause um, families of, of victims um, great distress? Uh, and I thank Ms Lewis for her question. She does correctly allude to the high number of deaths this year. We have to date 62 deaths. And while we must bear in mind that five years ago we had a year where we had 115 deaths, improvements have been made. We have reduced the amount of lives being lost on our roads, albeit there seem to be that figure sadly seems to be on the way up again this year. One death on the road is one too many. And the reduction that I have spoken of, where we have gone from being one of the countries in Europe with the most dangerous roads and the highest rates of fatalities, collisions and casualties, to a position where we are one of the safer countries in Europe, is attributable, without a doubt, in some part to the advertising campaigns of DOE. I would not claim sole credit for, uh, for DOE road safety advertising for these reductions, but uh, education, enforcement and engineering have all had a role to play with improving uh, road safety. Our campaigns have and will continue to play a significant part in our aspiration of working towards zero road deaths. And we do have extensive evidence that people do watch, are aware of and are influenced by our uh, advertising campaigns. I certainly would not sanction expenditure on something if, it wasn't, if I was not provided with evidence or convinced that it does represent value for money. And there have been numerous studies done over the years that, that, that show how many lives, in fact, have been saved through advertising. As regards the, uh, uh, the upset that may be caused to families of, of, of victims, obviously that is not the intention behind any advert. However, it is important that these ads are hard-hitting, and evidence again suggests that the more hard-hitting, the more impact they do have and the more influence that they do have on drivers' behaviour. Yeah, it was an important answer, but uh, can I just ask the Minister to respect the two-minute rule? And I call uh, Mr Cahill Boylan. I could have thanked the Minister for her previous answers, but could I ask the Minister, could he outline the extent of the working partnership between his department and the Road Safety Authority in the South, and arising from discussions, if any, what are the thematic priorities in relation to addressing the issues of road fatalities? Yes, 
thank Mr Boylan for uh, that question. There exists a very good uh, working relationship between my department, our officials dealing with road safety, and our counterparts and their counterparts working in the, the, the Republic of Ireland. Obviously, we share the same roads. Many of our drivers use roads in the Republic. Uh, many drivers from the Republic use our roads on a daily basis. So it's only right, it's only sensible that we do work closely on issues of road safety. Uh, it's an issue that I raise regularly at the North South Ministerial uh, Council meetings uh, with the Environment Minister from the South and the need to, to work closely on issues of road safety. Of particular uh, interest to the member might be the work ongoing, albeit more slowly than we would like, on the mutual recognition of penalty points in uh, both jurisdictions. I believe this will be a vital cog in, uh, I suppose, closing the gaps that exist w w within the system for bad and irresponsible drivers that might uh, float between both jurisdictions, putting people's lives, including their own, at risk in, in, in doing so. Uh, also through the Road Traffic Amendment Bill, which is currently progressing through, well, I hope it's progressing through uh, committee stage. The member will be uh, very familiar with that. Uh, we hope to change the drink drive limits here to bring them into correlation with uh, the, the limit in the Republic, and that again will, I suppose, reduce the grey area or eradicate the grey area that some people out there do exploit wittingly or unwittingly in many cases. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And, and I note the good intentions behind the Road Traffic Amendment Bill, especially in cutting down. Uh, uh, young fatalities, but does the Minister accept that what may work well in urban areas and our towns and cities may not work uh, so well in rural areas? Will the Minister give a commitment that he will listen to the concerns of rural communities on this bill? Thank Mrs. Over and uh, for that question and welcome the fact that she recognises the merits in the, the, the bill as it stands and no doubt it will retain many merits and hopefully contain some improvements once it has got through a committee stage and, and the other stages it must go through before it becomes law. Uh, at uh, its first reading in the Assembly, issues were raised or concerns were raised by some uh, representatives over some sort of disproportionate impact that this legislation might have on uh, people living in the countryside and driving. In, in, in the countryside, and, and, and I do assure the member that I will take account of all points raised at any stage uh, throughout this process. However, I must make the point that people from rural areas, particularly young males from rural areas, are particularly overrepresented when we look at the figures of casualties, and not, not even so much fatalities, but as causation of fatalities, collisions and casualties. There is a, a stark over-representation of people from and in rural c c communities. I think uh, it is important, of course, that, that we listen to concerns that are raised. It is important that whatever we do end up with and come out with is something that is workable and something that is enforceable, but it has to be something that is effective, and, and, and that is my aim at the end of the day. Thank you. And I call Mr Barry Michael Duff. Good morning, Mr. Duff. Free of last can call you. Uh, question number three, cash number three. Uh, with uh, little had a uh, free of last can call you, but I let no much severish for honey and fragrance show. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like a, a wee bit of extra time for this answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can't speed. <laughs> uh, the member will be well aware of the background to this issue and that this matter has been subject to considerable examination in the past. As part of the development of PPS 21, an independent working group was established to consider the issue of non-farming rural dwellers. The group was chaired by Jim McKinnon, the then Chief Planner for the Scottish Government, and involved experts from the fields of planning, the environment, rural development and the legal profession, who each brought their own individual expertise to the project. 
At that time, the IWG reached a number of conclusions, including that planning policy should not create a special category for non-farming rural dwellers. Planning applications for single houses should not be determined on the basis of kinship, connection or occupation. The previous Minister of the Environment again considered this issue as part of his review into the operation of the PPS 21, which reported in July 2013. As part of that review, he met with former members of the IWG to hear firsthand their expert perspectives on the matter. The advice was reiterated that the term non-farming rural dweller is difficult to interpret and define and should not therefore be used to create a special category of planning policy. Notwithstanding the above, members will be aware that my department recently consulted upon the draft strategic planning policy statement for Northern Ireland. The SPPS consolidates and, where necessary, updates existing policy provisions set out within the current suite of PPSs, including PPS 21, Sustainable Development in the Countryside. As part of this process, I gave an undertaking to this chamber that the SPPS should adequately meet the needs of current and future generations of farming and non-farming rural dwellers seeking permission to build in the countryside. My officials are currently analysing all of the responses, which will be carefully considered, and a synopsis made available to the Environment Committee. Once this exercise is complete, I will decide on the final policy direction in respect of non-farming rural dwellers and the SPPS overall. And I call Mr Barry Michael Duff for a supplementary. Uh, could I have an additional minute for my supplementary? <laughs> okay. uh, can, I thank, <laughs> can I thank the Minister for his answer and also thank the Minister for his agreement to meet with myself and a number of uh, architects, planning advisors from County Tyrone in the near future to discuss this. But ahead of that meeting, can I seek a commitment from the Minister that he will approach any new ideas, uh, proposed amendments, proposed improvements to PPS 21, that he will approach these with an open mind, especially if it improves the life chances of rural people who want to live and build in the countryside. Uh, thank uh, the, the member for the, the supplementary question, and indeed look forward to our meeting on the 28th of October. Uh, I can assure, assure the member that I will approach that meeting as I do any and every meeting with an open mind and I am always willing to hear constructive uh, input and ideas from other members of the Assembly, from experts in their field, be it architects or planning agents and indeed from members of the public. Thank you. And I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I do to thank the Minister for his contribution in relation to PPS 21. Does the Minister fully recognise the need for amendment to PPS 21 to allow people that are, have been brought up in the countryside to be included in uh, applications, for them to be considered, obviously under a measured uh, scheme, but for some flexibility to be given to people that, that families have been brought up in a local area and that they get a chance to, to retain there? Uh, thank uh, Mr Dunn for his supplementary question. And, uh, I, I, I do indeed recognise the needs and indeed, or indeed the desire that people who have been brought up in a particular area have to remain in that particular area. I do believe that where possible uh, provision should be and could be made within a policy to accommodate the, the needs of these people. However, it is worth bearing in mind that PPS 21, as it stands, does offer considerable development opportunities for non-farming rural people wishing to live in the countryside and not just farmers. Some, uh, I'd expect a couple of supplementaries to say that not even farmers, <laughs> I, I, I should be saying. But uh, these opportunities include replacement dwellings, the conversion and reuse of non-residential buildings as dwellings, new dwellings within an existing cluster or ribbon of buildings, social and affordable housing schemes, development within designated dispersed rural communities, and a dwelling to meet compelling personal or domestic circumstances. So, I would say there is certainly no uh, moratorium on uh, a building in, in the countryside for non-farming dwellers. Opportunities do exist, but evidently 
uh, from the contributions uh, of members, not just today, but we had a debate a few months ago on, on this subject, not sufficient opportunities seem to exist. I call on Mr. Sean Roger. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Minister, when we talk about farmers, can I ask you what discussions has your department had with DARD with respect to uh, the, the idea of an active farmer and how that will uh, inform future planning policy? Uh, I, I thank the member for his uh, supplementary question. Uh, my uh, officials work constantly with their counterparts in DARD on many uh, issues, uh, and, and, and this would certainly be one. Particularly, our representatives from NIEA and DARD have a lot of overlap as regards uh, farms and designation of areas. The member will be, be well aware he speaks to me often and enough about that. The definition of a working farm is something that has in the past caused uh, some consternation and I think it would be fair to say some confusion uh, when it comes to the interpretation and application of planning policy. Of uh, late, it seems that uh, planners, this is subsequent to uh, a few decisions by the Planning Appeals Commission, planners have been uh, assessing applications under PPS 21 CT by 10 more strictly and they're looking for more evidence of what constitutes a working farm. Or sorry, it's not that they're looking for more evidence, but it's that uh, the sources of evidence that they're looking for have been reduced. Now they and all bar the most extreme cases will require the DARD active farm uh, user number. Councillor Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for the answers there. Uh, given the, the recent uh, judicial review decision on a, a rural uh, planning application, I think it was in the Lisburn Council area, will this inform or, or will it mean the changes? To, from the department to planning service officers on the ground in relation to uh, dwelling applications, whether that's for farmers or non-farmers? Uh, thank Mr. Elliott for his uh, supplementary question. I feel and had uh, indicated in, in my previous answer that the outcome of be it JRs or planning appeals commission hearings do inevitably have a knock-on impact on the interpretation and uh, analysis or assessment of planning applications. I have seen uh, since, since a, a recent ruling, a tightening, if you like, on PPS 21, and uh, it seems to become somewhat more rigid. That's evidenced by the number of, of, of Assembly members here who have brought constituents in to me who maybe six or eight months ago might have got uh, per permission, but w w with the new reading of the rules, unfortunately, aren't. Uh, I think uh, it's worth bearing in mind. There is a balance to be struck here. No one, I think, would dispute that PPS 21 is, is much more permissive than its, its predecessor, PPS 14. However, it is there for a reason. There, there, there do have to be rules. Any development anywhere, let alone in the countryside, must be sustainable, and, and I think it's important that whatever we do arrive at through the SPPS, that that recognises that, and we do have a job to protect the countryside as well. Commissioner John McAllister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister accept that there are inconsistencies in the uh, application of this policy throughout Northern Ireland? Would he also uh, accept? that some families who do get permission to build uh, on a farm location then struggle uh, to get finance raised simply because uh, mortgage providers are, are nervous of the location if ever uh, repossession became an issue. Can I go to the field, yes, can call you and, and I thank uh, Mr McAllister for his question. I have no doubt that there have been uh, inconsistencies across the, the north, not only in I suppose, implementation of this particular planning policy, but of many planning uh, po policies. The, the issue around perceived inconsistencies around PPS 21, however, 
has been addressed to some extent by the establishment by my predecessor of a peer review group who will look at the more contentious or complex uh, PPS 21 applications. This uh, group consists of uh, senior planners from each of uh, the, 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 the planning divisions. And I, I think that's a, a, a very useful tool in order to, to, to hear what's going on in different areas, what views uh, planners bring to the table from those different areas. But I think it's vitally important as well that there is consistency right across the, the board when it comes to the implementation or application of any planning policy. As regards uh, difficulties around mortgage applications, this is something that I have also come aware of. Unfortunately, it's not something that is new. Uh, mortgage lenders have historically uh, been cautious around things pr such as occupancy conditions, which is something that's uh, unique almost to uh, country, country side applications as well. Uh, however, they do seem to have got a lot more cautious of late. Uh, where possible, I know that I have instructed uh, planning officials to intervene or to assist applicants, be that through a letter of comfort or letter of support to the, the lending company. Thank you. And it comes to Jerry Kelly. Part 9 of the Local Government Act 2014 introduced a new ethical standards framework for councillors. This framework consists of a mandatory code of conduct for councillors with supporting arrangements for investigation, adjudication and appeals. Members may recall that as a result of amendments agreed by the Assembly at the Bill's consideration and further consideration stages, provisions for a High Court appeal mechanism were introduced into the Local Government Bill. This would provide for any person who is subject to further action by the Commissioner as a result of their failure to comply with the Code of Conduct to appeal against the decision of the Commissioner to the High Court if the High Court gives the person leave to do so. The Ethical Standards Framework was brought fully into operation from the 2nd of June this year by commencement order. Members may recall that in response to concerns raised by the Commissioner about the effect which the introduction of a High Court appeal mechanism could have on his constitutional position, I had indicated that I was considering bringing forward a further bill to separate the investigation and adjudication functions of the Ethical Standards Framework. During the debate on the Draft Code of Conduct on the 27th of May this year, I informed the Assembly that I was seeking legal advice to assist in determining whether a new adjudication model would be needed. Following my consideration of that legal advice, I can now take this opportunity to confirm to members that I am satisfied that the current ethical standards framework can operate without further amendments, and you will be relieved to hear there is no requirement to bring forward a further bill. Therefore, the supporting mechanisms of investigation, adjudication and appeals, as currently provided in the 2014 Act, will not be subject to any further change. Mr. Kelly for supplement. Thank the Minister for his answer up to now. Uh, can maybe you give us a, after that uh, explanation um, where the post of Commissioner will be funded from? How will the funding be uh, dealt with? Uh, and I, I thank um, Mr. Kelly for that supplementary question. There had been some considerable debate as to not only the, the, the functions or the role of the Commissioner, but as to how that would be funded uh, from across the councils. <coughs> would it be done on a case-by-case -case basis, sort of if, uh, by the amount of cases coming to uh, the Commissioner from each council, would they have to pay on that basis? However, it's m my opinion that it should be top-sliced, the money uh, that they pay for this, before it goes out and becomes a function. That, that ends sense. the period for illicit questions. And we will now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. <coughs> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the, the Minister, in light of uh, a high profile campaign of residents in the Dunfield Terrace area of Derry, what was the rationale behind the planners in coming forward with an approval on that application for housing? 
Uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, <laughs> lots. Uh, this is, is not a decision that was reached lightly, not an approval that was reached lightly uh, but by planners in Derry, particularly given the high volume of objection and the high level of media interest in the application. And it's one that I uh, took a personal look at and uh, toiled with for some time. However, despite the numerous objections and grounds for objection, the planners have arrived at their decision to approve. In reaching this decision, the department have taken into account the views of statutory consultees, Derry City Council, objectors and supporters, and key to this, the planning history on site. From a planning perspective, the department considers that the principle of housing development on the site has been long established. Detailed design and roads matters, which historically had been the main impediment <coughs> to some previous applications on the site, were by and large addressed in this application. I have uh, received regular correspondence from objectors both in advance of this decision and subsequent to it. And, and, and I have to say, I'm heartened at the maturity they have shown and with which the, the, they have re received the, this decision. They, they do accept that uh, we were bound by policy and by planning history and that any outcome other than an approval was extremely unlikely. Mr. Ramsey for something. Yeah, I, I thank the Minister for his response and the clear evidence that it has been one of the most controversial sites given it is one of the most beautiful landmarks in the city. Is the Minister aware of uh, proposals tabled either via Council or via the resident group in terms of a land swap that might broker a deal that would enable housing to be built elsewhere and that land would be retained then for the beauty spot that it is? Uh, I thank Mr Ramsey for the supplementary question. He does quite rightly refer to the importance of this site and the, the, the city of Derry and, and its position as a suppose a strategic viewpoint for the, the city as a whole. As I said, I've been in regular uh, correspondence with objectors to this scheme and therefore am and have been made aware of negotiations between themselves, the landowner and statutory agencies such as the council. I'm uh, not privy to the, the full detail of those discussions. However, I am aware that the residents remain hopeful of a positive outcome and have offered them my support in, in, in order to achieve one. Thank you. Thank you. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Speaker. Deputy Speaker. <laughs> uh, Freudian slip there. Um, just sticking with the county Londonderry rather than the city and the planning application there that I invited the Minister and he kindly took up uh, in Port Stewart, uh, Strandview. Has the Minister anything to report given that it is eight months now since he visited that planning application and there still has been no outcome in terms of uh, uh, a response by planners? I would like to ask you to thank Mr Campbell for that question. I do indeed remember that site visit. I still have the scars, <laughs> I think. Uh, subsequent to that meeting uh, that we held with objectors to that uh, development, an approach was made from or by planning officials back to the developer. It's worth bearing in mind that this scheme was recommended for approval. However, uh, planners have gone back to the developer to ask him to, uh, I suppose, revisit the scheme uh, taking into consideration some of the concerns that were raised by objectors. Some of the concerns they raised were extremely pertinent. Some of the concerns they raised were less. So, uh, as far as I'm aware, and bear in mind that there, there are over 6,500 planning applications in the system at the time, I do believe that revised drawings have been submitted. Uh, we looked at those and uh, deemed that they weren't perhaps sufficiently revised and we are now either awaiting or have been in receipt of further revised drawings.
that will go some way to satisfying the concerns of residents. Mr Campbell for a supplement. I think the Minister for his response and for his visit uh, on that occasion. Um, it is a, a picture, picturesque beauty spot, as the Minister knows, uh, given that he had visited the site. But will he ensure that even with the amended drawings, that the uh, capacity for whatever number of dwellings the revised drawings uh, indicate will be looked at in the context of the existing properties there, that it will not run counter to the, uh, to the existing properties that are there? I uh, thank the, the, the member for the, the supplementary. What I can assure him, and I, I hope I have already assured him, as that the concerns of residents were heard that day. I said some of the concerns or objections they raised were more pertinent than others and had more weight in planning uh, terms than others. Attempts have been made uh, by, by my department to, I suppose, get an improved deal uh, for the, the residents who are objecting to the, this scheme, but I can't at this stage give the member any assurances as to how improved that might be. Thank you. And call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Corey Mugget, a free or last Corey, I want to, to ask the Minister about the former MOD site in Enniskillen of Grosvenor Barracks, which is a 17.2 acre site of which there are plans for 200 houses on it. Um, it is proposed to transfer that to the new councillor from Ananoma from the 1st of April. But can the Minister give me an assurance that that site will be used for social housing and it won't be sold off to the highest bidder? Uh, I thank uh, Mr Flanagan for his question. The application to which he refers, I have to plead complete ignorance about. I always think it's safe to say when you don't know the answer to something to admit it. I'm sure the member would agree with me on that. <laughs> uh, the, the, the issue, uh, the site itself has been passed to council. Okay, well then. Along with uh, the site going to council, what will be going to council, as the member will be aware, is the statutory function of planning. Uh, councils will be starting their own planning processes, that of drawing up their own local development plans. Uh, some of the councils, while still in shadow form, have commenced that work already. And an important part of these area plans will be the designation of sites and zones for social housing. Uh, I, I know that's something that's an acute need in many areas ac across the, the north, and I'm sure uh, the, the, the member's own constituency is no exception to that. So council will have a, a major, if not the final, say in what this uh, land is zoned for. Mr Flanagan, for supplement. The, the minister for his um, efforts to answer that question blind, and I commend him for it. But, um, I, I want to tease out a wee bit further with the Minister. Um, the, the site has been transferred to the Council, and, and is there any way that the Council can ensure that this site is developed for social housing um, instead of putting it on the market? You know, for example, will the Council be allowed to do a, a public sector trawl, which might include social housing providers, or would they be excluded from a, a public sector trawl? Well, uh, the, the Council will ultimately, as I, I, I have outlined, be able to say that that land is zoned for social housing. Unfortunately, it's outside of my gift or, or ability to say that it will ultimately there, though, be developed as social housing. That will require, as the member rightly identifies, a cooperation and collaboration between the council and social housing providers through the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and then ultimately the housing builders that will be housing associations if the demand exists in that area for social housing that I uh, uh, imagine does, if it's any way similar to other areas across the north, I can't think why it would have great difficulty getting on the social housing development programme eventually. However, that would be a question for the DSD Minister. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answers. Can the Minister uh, give us some further clarification on the new rate spilling system under RPA? He will be aware of the scare stories in the media last week in relation to the possibility of significant increases in rates due to the variation across new council areas? Uh, 
Gurmayad, a free will ask him, and I, I thank Mr. Dunn uh, for that question. Yeah, I did indeed see the scare stories, as uh, Mr. Dunn quite accurately put it, in the, the media last week, and wondered where they had come from, what had prompted them uh, arising just last week, after we've come so far down this road towards local government reform. I would be lying if I stood up here and said that there aren't going to be or haven't been issues around rates convergence, but a lot of work has been done and is being done to ensure that the impact of rates convergence on uh, ratepayers in certain areas across the north uh, is minimised. I know uh, Fermanagh is one area that uh, we'll see, or could potentially see a jump in their rates and there are others that will see equally uh, large jumps in their rates. My predecessor uh, managed to secure £30 million from the executive to deal with the issue of rates convergence, and DFP are currently finalising how the scheme that will, I suppose, dish out that £30 million to uh, mitigate any detrimental impact of rates convergence will, will look like. Mr. Dunn for supplementary. Thank you and thank the Minister for his answer. Would the Minister agree though, that it is important that there is an increase of public awareness of your transitional arrangements to give some assurance to the public that they're not going to be hit with massive bills increases? Uh, I thank the member for the, the supplementary question. And, and, and yes, do, do believe that, that we do have a responsibility, not just merely me as, as Minister uh, for the Environment or Minister Hamilton, uh, the Minister for Finance and Personnel, because ultimately it's going to be his transitional rates relief scheme as opposed to mine. But I think all the members uh, in here, all those who voted for the reform of local government, and even uh, those who might have voted against, do have a, a leadership role here to, to play and should be doing more to allay concerns rather than stir them up. Thank you. Call Mr. Alvin McGuinness. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister outline the impact or the implications of the October monitoring round on his department? And I thank the member for his question. My department currently has a range of actions to deliver in year 4.4% baseline reductions. These include the following measures. Ceasing to fill vacant posts in my department, that's 167 full-time equivalent posts. Ceasing the use of contract and temporary workers. Reductions in general admin expenditure across all business areas of the department. Utilisation of an in-year reduced requirement on the Ring Fence and Coastal Communities Fund. Postponement of planned procurements. Curtailing spend on a number of contracts. Reducing grants, unfortunately for a range of programmes and reducing the number of lower priority environmental programmes funded. Also, unfortunately, having to stop funding to any new projects or initiatives. My department has conducted a review of budgets across all business areas and the measures identified to deliver the in-year cuts are those measures deemed to lessen the impact on the department's ability to deliver public services. However, the impact of these cuts on my department's programmes is magnified because of the inability for my department to cut local government grants in a year, and this means that the impact of such percentage cuts falls disproportionately and unfairly on core departmental programmes. I put forward a bid as part of October monitoring to seek the reinstatement of part of the reductions made at June that was actually less than a million pounds, 0.9 million pounds, and requested that the local government grants be excluded from any reductions. Unfortunately, this issue hasn't been addressed, and therefore means that funding for core departmental work in my department has been disproportionately and unfairly reduced. Order, uh, and time is up.